Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. I'm Dan Lemieux, the County Board Chairman, uh, co-host of this program, this uh, tape show that we put on monthly, along with Adam Payne, our Administrative Coordinator. And we bring you on a monthly basis the services that county government provides the residents of Sheboygan County and the people that provide those services. Today we have with us Shannon Hayden, uh, the Planning Director, and uh, Shannon is going to talk with us a little bit about the Planning and Resource Department. And Shannon, you're uh, our newest department head in Sheboygan County, and why don't you start by uh, giving our viewers just a little background about yourself and the position of Planning Director. Sure. I originally grew up in the city of Oshkosh, and as soon as I was old enough, I got out of there and went to UW-Eau Claire for my bachelor's degree and uh, finished a master's degree at the University of M Milwaukee. Um, both those degrees are in geography, which uh, you can get a job in geography for those of you who are thinking of pursuing it. Um, the planning director position oversees basically two functions, the planning and resources side of the department and then also the real property listing office. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, I believe, later. And um, those are the well, Why don't you basics. just give us, uh, as we start out this discussion, the mission and primary responsibilities of the department? Sure. The mission of the department is to um, improve the quality of life in the communities of, this, of Sheboygan County, to protect the natural resources within those communities, and also improve the property records in those communities. And our responsibilities include overseeing the shoreline floodplain ordinance, the sanitary ordinance, the land division ordinance, and then also the update of the tax records within the county. And Dan, I think we've let her off too easy already. Now, when she had to share a little bit about herself, she's moved to the area, she's bought a house here, and she also worked with the department in a previous capacity. Now, what was that? I was formerly the assistant director of planning, and in April, I took over the role of interim director, and then recently in August, I was named the, the planning director, which I'm very excited about. We have a great group of staff, and I think Sheboygan County is a great place to live. I'm happy to have moved in here and now be a taxpayer in the county. <laughs> and is it better than Oshkosh? You said you, as soon as you're old enough, you left Oshkosh. You know, there's a lot of people that enjoy the city, and I still have family there, and I, I do like it, but I don't think I could live there. Um, Sheboygan is definitely a much nicer community. The, the roads are better kept, I think. You talked about the staff in your department. How many employees do you have in, in your department? How is the department structured? We have 12 staff. Most of them are um, represented union staff, except for one who the real property lister is also management staff. One of the greatest benefits that I can say that I have working with my staff is they all have been there for a long time. We do not have a high turnover rate. I believe our um, least senior staff has been there for between six or eight years. And some of my other staff have been there between 20 and 25 years, so they bring a wide range of experience and a wealth of knowledge, and I tap into that all the time. I, I really think that that is probably the key to making that department successful. Great. You mentioned the real property lister before. Could you just explain a little bit? I mean, we have, and you've talked about tax, uh, taxes before, you talked about uh, property listing, uh, deeds, things like that. Uh, we have other offices in the county that take care of some of these things also, but what is, maybe you could explain a little bit about the responsibilities of the real property lister. Sure. That office takes care of all of the land divisions or if a subdivision is created from a parcel or any of the transfers that occur within Sheboygan County except for in the city of Sheboygan. The city of Sheboygan handles those um, services separately. However, anything that occurs um, related to a parcel in the county is funneled through the real property listing department or office and they handle all the legal descriptions for the tax bill. So anytime an individual would need to have a legal description of their property, they could call the real property listing office. Some of the other individuals who use that office are real realtors, attorneys when they're doing title searches or any kind of um, work associated with real estate, and then also title companies to work. So if you've um, sold or purchased land in, in Sheboygan County, at some point in time, somebody used the real property listing office throughout that process. What is, you know, I'll share with everybody my, my ignorance of this area. 
What is the difference between the Register of Deeds Office and the Real Property Registrar's Office? Sure. The Register of Deeds Office records all of the documents that need recording by state statute or any other document that you wish to have in the official public record, such as birth certificates, death certificates, land records, such as the deeds. Your mortgage is re recorded in the Register of Deeds Office. And what we get is just a small portion of that. The land records information is transferred from real prop or the Register of Deeds to our office for entering so that we can keep those records up to date. So people searching in the real property listing office will look for the document numbers and then go down into the Register of Deeds and actually pull out the actual deed or the map for their searches. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that you're enjoying your time in Sheboygan County, that it's a beautiful county, that the roads are in good shape. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we also have a lot of uh, very nice recreational facilities and opportunities. Why don't you touch on that a little bit? Sure. We have a number of facilities, as you mentioned. One of them is the Old Plank Road Trail. It's 14 miles running from um, Erie Avenue at the end, just west or east of I-43 is a trailhead. You can park your car go under I-43 via a tunnel and travel on the trail all the way out to Greenbush. And we're hoping to, in 2004, we have some, some grant money to extend the trail from the Greenbush trailhead all the way out there to the Wade House. So an individual could bicycle from the city of Sheboygan to the Wade House at within probably 2005, I believe, it will finally be ready to go. And also, the city of Sheboygan has cooked has hooked up to our trailhead so one could bicycle from the lakefront to the trailhead and then go out. Some of the stops along the way include um, Kohler, the city of Sheboygan Falls, the city of Plymouth, and then along the way um, the various towns. People stop at the cross sections with the trail and, and hop on there. Um, it's a great opportunity for individuals who live in a rural part of the county so they're not trying to walk on a busier, higher speed roadway. They can utilize the trail and still enjoy some um, fitness. In addition to that, we have the Broughton Marsh. It's a 14,000 acre wetland ecosystem and it's a wonderful resource if you enjoy um, any kind of recreational boating or hunting. You can hunt out at the marsh. Um, if you want any information about that, you can call our office and we can talk about that a little bit later. But um, there is some private property surrounding the marsh, so you'll want to make sure that you've clearly identified where you are. And if you want to go on private property, you need to request permission. In addition to that, we have a 66-site campground at the developed portion of the, of the marsh and a restaurant which has wonderful food. And in the wintertime, snowmobilers utilize that area a lot. And there's a number of opportunities out there. And then in addition to that, we have a, a number of boat landings. And it'll take me a minute to think about them off the top of my head. We have Gerber Lake, Yetzer Lake, um, Big Art, Elkhart Lake, Little Elkhart Lake, and Crystal Lake. I believe there's five where you can put in a boat and enjoy fishing. In the wintertime, people utilize those um, launch areas for their ice shanties as a put-in place for that. And some of those facilities have restrooms, so you can uh, take care of those needs when you're out there fishing. And those are, those are the major facilities that the county has that, that open up a lot of opportunities for the residents. Some great facilities, and I know your department provides a complimentary map, so if any of our viewers wanted to get a sense of where these lakes are or lake accesses or learn more about the, the marsh, they can do so. Uh, speaking of the marsh, there's been a fair amount of publicity of late with the drawdown, and, and could you give our viewers a snapshot of what's happened out there the last few months and, and what the status is of the drawdown? Sure. Just very briefly, because I know some people aren't 100% sure of why the whole process was begun in the first place. Sheboygan County was spending approximately thirty-five dollars to $40,000 every year removing um, floating cattail mats. That um, Cattails are a natural plant that occur in a wetland area, but because of fluctuations in the marsh water level, because of the large drainage area, um, the roots break free and the mats float into the dam and it becomes this 
giant land mass almost. So the highway department has to fish them out and truck them somewhere. So we're running out of disposal space and there's significant costs. So we decided to, after a long study and public input process, draw down the marsh so that the cattails could establish a strong root system and then also so we could um, increase the, the diversity of vegetation out at the marsh. It's another portion of it is that the wildlife and species diversity at the marsh was starting to diminish. A key indicator of that is what's called macroinvertebrates or the um, crawfish might be considered one. Things that fish eat, the smaller um, organisms that they eat, the diversity was dropping off. So that kind of indicates that there was some balance that needed to be restruck out there. So we're drawing the marsh down with increasing the, the various types of vegetation. We start to see an increase in bird diversity and other tenant um, wildlife species that will be out there which will improve the water quality and also just the general system health. Right now we've actually put the boards in the bypass to bring the water level back up yesterday. Um, one of my staff has a, has a great way of saying it's not magic, it's not going to come up tomorrow. We're anticipating perhaps boating can begin again as it's, it's limited right now with the water level being lower um, back perhaps in the middle of October. We're hoping a lot of it, all of it is dependent on what kind of rain event we have. To give you a little bit of an example, in the middle of um, August we had about a two inch rain event and it brought the level of the water up 24 inches at the drawdown level. So the marsh can fill up quite quickly, but if we don't have any rain to do that or if we have dry conditions, it will not occur. So um, we'll find out how successful we were probably in, in the spring or next summer. Very nice overview. And if you haven't been out to the marsh in a while, I encourage you to get out there. Again, whether you like to, to swim or boat or fish or trap, or just hike and uh, the colors I'm sure this fall will be nice and then stop in the, the lodge and have a sandwich or a refreshment but it's, it's a neat place to mm -hmm. check out and I know there's been a lot of work out there. You've mentioned some improvements already, the, the possibility of expanding or extending some of the uh, trails that we have. You've mentioned the work out at the marsh to improve that, uh, to improve the functionality there. What other uh, opportunities or things do you see on the horizon to improve facilities in the county? Right now in our five-year strategic plan we have a, a project on, on the horizon for 2006 to develop um, the Sheboygan Co County portion of the Interurban Trail and I've received a number of inquiries on that extension especially since Ozaki County has completed their portion right now the Ozaki County um, Trail ends right at our county line so people are itching to get further north to give you a little bit of a background, the interurban line came up from Milwaukee and it, and it brought a number of individuals into the area for the weekend or the summer home um, type of scenario. Uh, some of it I'm sure was probably business travelers, though back in those days people didn't travel for business as frequently as we do today. We would like to take that, that old right away and, and put a trail through there for bicycling or um, rollerblading, walking, those sorts of things. So we're hoping to get started on that, doing some engineering. There's some um, negotiation we'll have to do with the right-of-way acquisition, I think. But um, we're working on that, and, and if that actually can move forward, we'll be quite excited because there's a number of great opportunities for that. That's the big one that's on the horizon and besides the other ones I've spoke about. Stewardship was a big initiative in Sheboygan County in the last couple of years. There's been a lot of discussion, uh, input from the public, a committee was formed, decisions were made, dollars have been appropriated, and uh, right now I believe you're in the process of working with an advisory committee and selecting some projects. Why don't you give our viewers a sense of where that's at and, and what, are, what types of projects have been, come in for funding? Sure. Actually, this evening is the meeting where the, the decisions will be made as to which projects would be funded and at what level, and those recommendations will be um, passed along to the Resources Committee, which oversees my department as part of the county board. They are ultimately the committee that will make the final decision. Um, we have six wonderful projects that have been submitted for application. Um, one in the village of Elkhart Lake to increase some nature trails around their athletic field. 
one in the city of Plymouth to do some remediation and restoration after the removal of the dam at Meyer Park. And the city of Sheboygan submitted an application for a promenade at the Sea Rice Coal property to enhance some of the things that they're doing down there. We had two applications for purchase of development rights from the Sheboygan Area Land Con Conservancy, and then an application for purchasing land within the Milwaukee River Basin Heritage and Wildlife Area. It's an extremely long name, and I never can fully remember it. But those are the six projects that um, would be potentially available for funding. This year we have approximately $80,000 in the I believe the total request for 547,000. So obviously not every project will be funded and I'm not, there's a couple that could be funded for the amount requested but um, I'm anticipating but I don't want to speak for the committee. They may choose a combination of projects to fund at a lower level um, or they could choose to fund one project at the entire amount. Um, We'll see how things go tonight, but I do believe there will be at least one successful project, hopefully a number more, that can move forward um, with the county stewardship funds. And the best situation is when we can leverage county dollars with local or private or state or federal dollars to make some of these good projects happen. Uh, speaking of initiatives, smart growth planning has been discussed more and more throughout the county. Uh, Chairman Lemmy, who's lived here pretty much all his life. You and I moved to the area within the last year or two, myself four years, and uh, people are finding that Sheboygan County is no longer a great secret. It's a wonderful place to live and raise a family. And with that development pressure, comes more pressure on our towns and municipalities and how we're gonna grow and do so wisely. What is the county's role right now? What, how are the stewardship dollars being proposed to help us prepare for smart growth and uh, good land use planning in the county? Um, back in, I believe, the spring of last year, the Stewardship Ad Hoc Committee had recommended grants to communities to assist in their comprehensive planning efforts, in part with the thinking that right now, few communities actually have a full-blown comprehensive plan as identified in the state statutes. They have portions of the plan to guide them through the land use decision-making process. However, um, they, for example, with the stewardship funds, with the plans that are there, very few of them say this parcel would be worthy of recreational opportunities. So the thinking was if we could get communities completing their smart growth plan and identifying key areas and key projects that what they would like to do to enhance conservation and recreation in the county, there'd be a rational nexus between the dollars being spent and the, the lands being used or developed. So we've committed to giving $5,000 per local unit of government for comprehensive planning. And then if that unit of government chooses to partner with at least one other community, for example, um, the one that we know is in the works for a partnership is the, the town of Sherman and the villages of Random Lake and Adele have agreed to go in together they would be eligible for a total of $30,000 of county grant money to help them move forward with the comprehensive planning process. And that will help them leverage some other dollars from the state and help them get through the process sooner. And I think, just as an aside, that's a great place to start because they are receiving a lot of development pressure coming up from Ozaki County. So um, I think well, they're in a position to really have some, some great planning efforts there. But I think so far that's been really receptive and ultimately the plans that are generated through this process will help the county with its comprehensive plan. So if, if people fail to plan, they're planning to fail. And we really need everyone to work together and discuss what we're gonna look like 10, 15, 20 years down the road and where we want growth, what areas we want recreational trails or areas uh, preserved or areas for industrial development. And not only does the Stewardship Fund provide a, a small incentive for helping a community start those plans, but I know you've been active with uh, the extension agents right. and holding seminars. That, that would be my last question before turning it back to Dan. What has the county done to assist communities in looking at this? Well, right now we are working with um, very slowly putting together this process. To be honest, this sort of thing is 
somewhat foreign or it's a new process for a lot of the local units of government and some of them are a little bit skeptical, some of them are a little bit upset because it's coming from the state, but I do believe it's a good thing in that when the final product is done they'll be happy because they'll have a tool to be able to make decisions by. What the county so far has been <coughs> offering are the workshops, but we have a number of data sets that are available and we hope to have a package that we can put together for the consultants that the communities choose to use for their planning efforts. Some of the communities have chosen to go off on their own and intend to write the plan on their own and are doing the various things, um, components in, independently. In those respects, the extension office has been working closely with them in addition to a number of communities on some visioning or community um, planning efforts where they sit down as a group and say, we want housing to be here in our community and we, we don't need industrial development in our community so let's keep that off the map and that sort of thing. So between the county's data sets and what Extension is doing, our thinking is that communities will have very little that they'll need the consultant to do for them when it comes time to pull it all together for their actual plan. We hope to be able to do that for communities because we know budgets are tight everywhere and we're not reinventing the wheel because we already have that information in our office. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Shannon, uh, earlier you, you talked about some of the different areas that your department gets involved in and, and three of the areas that we really haven't talked about yet are the uh, areas of the septic systems, the uh, floodplain shoreline zoning, and land divisions. My first contact with your department was like 19 years ago when I was selling a residential property and I had one of your long-term employees come to my property and tell me I need to put a mound system in. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that area of your, your department? Sure. It's actually a big portion of our department and um, a lot of why our department was created was because of the shoreland floodplain ordinances and the, the sanitary ordinances which are um, if you will, mandates from the state. A lot of people are beginning to move out into the rural areas of our county and they're finding that um, perhaps things aren't as simple as they thought. Um, you know, just walk up and buy a lot and put your house up. You have to think about where is my septic system going to go. Our office um, handles all the permitting process with that. You would go out and, and uh, find an installer and, and they take care of all the permitting, but we kind of act as the to check on that system, make sure that the, the installer's done their job, make sure that when you, you should have a pretty clear mind, there are some maintenance as you know of your septic system and some things to be aware of when, you're, when you have one on your site, but um, you, should, you should have ease of mind that it was put in the ground properly and it's going to last the lifetime that it's, it's supposed to, and that's kind of what our department is responsible for. The other, um, another portion is the shoreland floodplain which is, um, we have jurisdiction within 300 feet of a, of a river or stream, and there's a number of stipulations with that too, but for simplicity's sake, we'll say that, and then a 1,000 feet of, of an inland lake. And within that area, there's a number of um, restrictions, I guess, if you will, on certain things that you, setbacks from the waterway, things that you can do, expansion types of things. So I always recommend if you, are near a waterway, call our office. The worst that can happen is it doesn't apply to you um, and, and then you can move forward with like that. The land divisions, um, anytime you want to split off a parcel of land, you should always call our office again. Um, it's called our subdivision ordinance, which confuses a lot of people if they want to just split off a small piece of land, but it really applies to any division of land under 40 acres. And given that even in farmland is sold in 40s, likelihood of you needing a, to do work under our land division ordinance is pretty high. So call our office if you plan to buy or sell um, a piece of land that isn't already existing um, to make sure you're in compliance. <laughs> So you talked about a lot of things in the last couple of minutes. I know. <laughs> so if a person is, is going to go out of an incorporated area, out of Sheboygan, Plymouth, Oostburg, Howard's Grove, into the rural areas and, and buy a piece of property or even buy an established residence, what, what should they do to protect themselves? 
The first thing I would do is, if you're interested in a home or if you're interested in a lot, call our office and find out any information they, we might have on your parcel. For example, if an existing, existing home, before you would close on the house, some banks do require that the septic system is inspected to ensure it's not failing. And that seems somewhat cumbersome at the time. It's probably about a $250 or $300 cost. However, if you purchase the home and the septic system is failing, you're going to have a much more significant cost associated with it. So That's when I met your department <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> and so the other thing we're finding is the sanitary code has changed. And there are a number of times when a mound system is the system of choice because of the soils and the depth of the groundwater. We have a lot of high groundwater in our county. Those systems tend to be a little more expensive. However, it opens up opportunities for you as a homeowner or a potential homeowner that perhaps you went to have had a few years ago. Um, so you want to call, find out if we have any information about the existing septic system, or if there's no septic system, you want to make sure that a soils test is done on the property to make sure that you can put one there. Um, probably one of the biggest misconceptions that we have is that if a lot has been created, it's buildable, and that's not always the case. The only way that one can tell if a lot is buildable is if a soils test has been done. And if you're out there looking for a lot and no soils test, test has been done, I would highly recommend putting that as a contingency of your closing because you don't want to get stuck with a lot you can't build on. Mm. So those are two big ones, is making sure that the lot is buildable um, and then the rest of it is handled by the individual you choose to install that system. In 30 seconds, <laughs> <laughs> if a person has a 40-acre parcel, a 50-acre parcel, and they want to split off uh, just a couple acres for building, what, what do they need to do to protect themselves? They need to hire a surveyor to do a certified survey map and split that parcel off. They'll also need to have soils tests done in that lot that they're splitting. And if there's an existing house with a septic system on anywhere on that 40 acres, they would need to have a septic inspection done. So those are all things that you need to keep in mind when you're deciding to divide your land. And if uh, we have a few more questions, but we're running out of time. If anybody has any questions on any of the things we've talked about or, or any other areas that they feel your, your office could help you with, them with, uh, what number would they call or how would they get in touch with you? Um, you can call 459-3060, and any of our staff would be more than happy to help anybody. We want to make sure that people get in on the early end so that we can help them through the process because it can get kind of frustrating sometimes. Well, thank you, Shannon. It was very interesting. I've learned some things, and hopefully our viewers learn some things also. Uh, next month, our guest is going to be Chuck Mayer, the, uh, he runs the county airport. Uh, I think he's been with the airport since its inception, uh, quite a few years ago. And uh, he knows everything there is to know about the airport and all the improvements that are going on in the future of the airport. And we look forward to Chuck next month and filling us in on, on the airport and what it means to Sheboygan County. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, if you have any suggestions for our shows, uh, call 459-3103. We'd be glad to uh, entertain your suggestions. Thank you.